Yeah. What's going on? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I am Two Below, Tom Brown. And we are coming to you from the Guest House Theater at Graceland. We have an audience here live of Elvis fans, and we've got some fans online, I believe I was told. They're watching a streaming event. So, Elvis fans live, say hello to the people at home watching on streaming. Graceland Elvis week, nine days, because the Beatles had eight days a week, so Elvis said, fine, we'll do nine days a week. Elvis week, 2023, and I gotta tell you, um, I'm pretty excited uh, about this. It's one of the events that I've been looking forward to all week. Uh, we have a new edition uh, of Aloha from Hawaii via satellite. Uh, you, you heard Elvis talking about that right there in the, in the video. He seemed to be very excited about it. So, uh, <laughs> one of the things that I, that I think is interesting about where we are in Elvis history is we continue to welcome new fans to the family. And if some of you are here for the very first time at an Elvis event, we welcome you to the big worldwide Elvis family. Give yourselves a hand, Elvis fans. All right. Now, we're going to talk about uh, Aloha from Hawaii, and I'm going to bring a couple of gentlemen out. Uh, I have a couple of firsts. My first first. Um, thank you. Thank you. You got that. I appreciate that. Uh, these gentlemen I've worked with before on the releases of Elvis, uh, the product and uh, the, the, what they do with the music and the, the packaging is just fantastic. So let's welcome them to the stage. Uh, Roger Seaman, who is the art director and the photo researcher on this project. Roger, come on out. Hi. Good to see you. Hi, Tom. Good to meet you. We've got your drums back there ready to go for you. And the producer of the project. Uh, you guys have worked together, I don't know how many years. Well, since about 1986. Yeah. How long is that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Too long. <laughs> Two winks and a nod. Uh, Ernst Jorgensen, the producer of the movie Aloha from Hawaii. Everybody gets a Hitchcock entrance there with a, with a shadow. Good to see you. Yeah. Have a seat. Have a seat. We've got some fun planned. Now, what we are going to do is kind of take you through the the new the new uh, Aloha from Hawaii and uh, you got to hear some of it at the beginning of this what did you think of that yeah you're gonna play it that loud in your car too I bet aren't you yeah that's what I've done you know here's what happens you 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 buy you buy an Elvis record you buy a CD whatever and you you, you this is the first contact you have with it yeah is the box and as kids you know we buy this. And we had to bicycle, had a bicycle home with this under our arm to put on the turntable. <laughs> Tell me about this. First of all, for you, um, this this project of Aloha from Hawaii. I mean, as a concept in Elvis's career, how did a project like this come up? Well, I think uh, we're all older and wiser now, and we all understand why the Colonel didn't really want Elvis to travel outside of the United States. Um, and during the '60s, it wasn't an issue because he very shrewdly used Hollywood to send Elvis all around the world's movie theaters, promoting his new soundtrack, um, or as a or as, uh, soundtrack release, or as Elvis would say, escape, and uh, it did a great job for him. But um, I think when Elvis uh, decided to go back live on stage in uh, 1969, uh, a lot of clever overseas tour promoters started throwing millions of dollars at the colonel's desk. And they were also very good at creating publicity for it as well. I mean, there were articles in the UK press of like fish, fish eye concert with Elvis at Wembley Stadium, where they were going to put him in a big bubble. Yeah. All that kind of nonsense got a lot of press coverage. And uh, it excited people like me because I thought I'm going to see Elvis at last. But whether it was true or not, and uh, in the, obviously from the Colonel's perspective, the last thing he wanted to do was actually agree to any of it, but he had to look as if he was reasonably interested. So uh, with all that press activity and the, the millions of dollars stories floating around, I think Elvis and certainly people around him became aware of this stuff. So the Colonel had to come up with a big idea uh, to kind of keep he could get his back away from the wall and then press Elvis and I think just as if he'd come up with a better better idea for Elvis. Like this is even better than going on tour because one show can do it. That's exactly right. And 
it's almost like technology had finally caught up to allow something like this to happen. Yeah, I think it had. And I, I think the, the, the Colonel, we all know, was an incredibly shrewd and savvy man when it came to manipulating the media, right? Well, yeah, and, uh, manipulate it, yeah. It, it, yeah. <laughs> And it, you know, it all, all started off through television, and, and, and his expertise was in like, how do we get all Elvis to the biggest mass audience in the simplest way? And he was uh, uh, appreciating what the boxing industry had done uh, using satellite broadcasts, because obviously with the heavyweight title fights, there were a lot more tickets to be sold than just in the major arena or wherever the fight was taking place. Uh, so obviously, uh, I uh, used to use satellite to broadcast them all around the world and create this massive audience. And, it what, and yeah, and it wasn't just uh, the, the, the boxing, it was uh, just not long before Aloha, uh, Nixon had got, been live via satellite from China. From China. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that really impressed, rightly or wrongly, but that really impressed uh, the Colonel. So armed with this information and obviously trying to get out of a very tight corner, uh, he came up with uh, obviously a surrogate worldwide tour concert, uh, a worldwide tour, which was uh, became the Aloha from Hawaii project. And uh, yeah, as you say, Elvis uh, live from Hawaii, but projected all around the world in, uh, on January the 14th. Yeah. Now, this project, then, you know, what you were just talking about, a great insight into Colonel trying to figure out what's the next big thing to bring to Elvis. Yeah. Um, Elvis reacted how? how? How do we know that he reacted to an idea like this? Well, I think, uh, I think uh, as you quite rightly say, in that press conference, it's kind of, so what? Uh, yeah. To the first of the first of the first. Yeah. And um, it's a bit low key, and it's a bit upsetting in a way, because it's like, why, why weren't you excited and, uh, and keen on this, on this idea? And I think very similar to the 68 comeback special, it, it took a creative mind, an excited mind, to visualize what was going to happen and how it was going to be for Elvis. So uh, it, it was only when Elvis actually met Marty Bassetta, the uh, director, who recently directed the Academy Awards for NBC, um, that Elvis became enthused by it. And um, the late Marty Bassetta, wrote about his, his experience in meeting Elvis for the first time at the Hilton Hotel. And it's the classic intimidation situation uh, where he arrived at the Hilton and he goes into Elvis's room and the bodyguards, some bodyguards are sitting there and everyone's got sunglasses on. That, that's kind of threatening, right? A little bit. I, even I look threatening with sunglasses. <laughs> he doesn't look threatening. He doesn't look threatening. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Uh, so um, he says to Elvis, and uh, uh, I, I went to see your show in Long Beach, uh, and he said, your voice was fantastic. He said, but the show was a little static, uh, and I need to do something about that. I mean, I would never nerve to say that to Elvis. I don't know if you would. But uh, anyway, Marty was a truthful guy, and obviously this is what Elvis appreciated. So he said, there's a static show. So if I'm going to have to do a 90-minute special for NBC, I'm going to have to create excitement without interfering with your stage uh, show. I'm going to have flashlights everywhere. I'm going to bring in a creative director. His name was uh, Ray Clausen uh, to create a magnificent set behind you of uh, Elvis spelled in all different languages in neon lights. Um, we're going to create an outline, a giant outline of your figure and it's going to look fantastic behind you all the time. He's kind of doing this, you know, while he's talking. And no one says a word. And uh, so he, uh, he carries on and says, yeah, he said, um, I'm going to have some reflective stuff in the corner so it reflects you as you're walking across the stage. I've got a big, long platform in front so you can walk through the crowd and just make the whole thing a lot busier than what I saw in Long Beach. And Elvis kind of put his sunglasses down on the table. And he walked over to Marty and he said, I love the idea. <laughs> <laughs> you got the job. So yeah, uh, yeah. Marty, Marty felt good about that. That's almost but... exactly Steve Bender's story yeah, uh, from yeah. putting together the 68 comeback that yeah. once challenged, once once challenged and stood up to and talked to honestly, yes. Elvis was 
picking up that challenge and saying, let's do this together. Yeah, well, and, and, and uh, regardless of the spiel, I think if, you, if the Aloha special has got a magical look about it on camera. I mean, if the, everything that he spoke about works. You've got that magnificent backdrop. And if it had just been a, a theatre in itself with Elvis on the stage, it, it wouldn't have looked anywhere near as impressive as the end show. And the other thing I think that really makes it intimate is the use of video. Uh, because if you look at the magical close-ups of Elvis's face in Aloha, every, every drip of sweat or tear, whatever, is, it's all there in you. It's, it's so clear. And I think it creates a great intimacy, and that's why that program is so unique. And I think Marty Pesetta deserves a hell of a lot of credit for what he pulled off there, because yeah. that would have been tough. A producer like that used to live television is one thing, but he had had a background in sports, award yeah. shows, in things that were fast moving. Yes. And knowing how to cut, knowing how to place ca camera placement, very important. Exactly. Um, and all of that, Elvis accepting the challenge, Elvis never looking better. Yes. Um, and as Linda Thompson told us here during Elvis Week, who was his girlfriend at the time, he took that challenge and got in shape and was on a 500 a, a day calorie diet. Yeah, the, the other thing he said to him actually before he shook his hands was, you need to lose 25 pounds. I, wow. I kind of wouldn't have come out with that one. Wow, so, yeah. yeah, well he took it as a challenge and he said, I'm gonna look good. And, and, yeah. and I would say that the, the diet succeeded. Yeah. And uh, they go to Hawaii, they do this concert, but Ernst, you do something in Elvis's uh, song catalog that I always like is, is the, one of the first things you do is you look at where a project was in someone's career, what was going on at the time. So where, where exactly does Aloha fit into what's going on in Elvis's career at the time? I mean, he had a 23 year career alive and 50 more years after that. But yeah. so, so there's all these uh, stories within the story and uh, excuse me, I'll, I'll go back a little bit to put this in perspective. In, uh, in March of 68, Elvis had the, this is at his you know, bottom of his career. It's a new movie called Live a Little, Love a Little. Doesn't make it at box office. The single from it, A Little Less Conversation, went to number 70, 70 on the Billboard charts. Nothing had ever done so poorly. And three months later, he records what we call the compact special. And the whole world changes 180 degrees. Suddenly, he's brought back. He then makes the Memphis sessions where he does in the ghetto, suspicious by his don't cry daddy, mom like the roses, all these phenomenal hits. And suddenly, he is in the center of the music business again. The following year, MGM decides to do a movie about Elvis Presley rehearsing for Las Vegas to be seen all over the world. You know, so they, they will know how he puts his act together, how he jokes around, and, and that will be sent around the world. Two years later, they make another one, Elvis on tour. You know, We go on tour with Elvis and see the excitement of that happening. And we had the summer of 72. He placed four sold out gigs at Madison Square Garden in New York. In November, the on tour movie comes out, and then Aloha from Hawaii. This is the ultimate triumph of his career. And on another level, an artistic level, again, when you go back, he does the 68 special, and we all love If I Can Dream, but basically Elvis was showing the world what he used to be just in a better and more updated version. And when he goes to Las Vegas, there's a bit of that. But when we get to that, the way it is. Elvis is the king. He sings whatever he wants to sing, cover versions, country songs, stupid songs, whatever. But he's in total charge. And when you then get to the freedom that that uh, means to Elvis, song selection is something that only he decides. He has now this big orchestra, the two sets of backdrop singers, so he can do anything. And he loved the idea of the drama. And said, Let, let's have a look at what now my love to just, you know, support that point of view.
couple of things I, I was saying to Roger, that you, you feel that song building, the whole, the drama of that song building to that last section when he just takes it up and makes it even bigger. And that's a great example also of that Marty Presetta chosen production team yeah. that did so many close-ups and worked with Elvis. I mean, it was really a fantastic special for television yeah. because that was back in the era before the giant screens like we have you know, in our homes now. And to see that face and to have that drama build. So great choice to, well, it, to show it, the drama of the song selection. I don't know if you do that at home. I actually don't, but just to go with it, just imagine the, the, what Elvis felt when he's up there at the end doing yeah. this, <laughs> like he's directing the bloody orchestra. Yeah. But you can see, you can see in his whole body that he's totally excited. He, yeah. mean, it's not like he's doing it. No, he's into it. He is it when yeah. he does it. So, yeah. so um, oh, there's a lot of songs like that, but uh, this is brilliant, I think. And it's a new song at that time. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I love uh, in the way you guys are putting the packaging together, it, together is you're kind of obviously taking off on the, what was originally there. Yeah. And inside the gatefold, you know, when you when you open the album, you've got that world that world map that uh, I think they've got a slide of that. Yeah. You've got that world map that, that really shows. I mean, every almost everybody in the world could pick this up and see. Yeah, and everything's in all different languages as well, rather than taking on the theme from Elvis in different you know, yeah. uh, languages at the back of the stage. So uh, all that, uh, I mean, that album, when it came out, really stood out in its, in its own right, because the artwork was, was uh, quite striking. Yeah. Like. One of the things that, that, that I thought was, was interesting about this was how quickly this album got in stores. Mm -hmm. But that had been kind of a precedent set early in Elvis's career. Yeah, I mean, they, they did Madison Square Garden in just a few weeks, and they sold a million. And it was, uh, see, this is live performance. And back then, there was a unpleasant thing going on in the uh, business that bootleggers bootlegged big constant, put them out on, on records instantly. It had been a problem with the Bangladesh show. and. Mm -hmm. So, so you knew you had to prepare it all. You had to prepare the artwork so you didn't have to wait until you knew what songs Elvis would do. Um, so it came out very quickly. The, the, this, the real show was uh, recorded then filmed on January 14 and 10 days later they mixed the album one day, mixing and then it separates in the stores all over the world. Yeah, and uh, in my house the next day, and in your house the next day after that. <laughs> and, 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 you know, one of the, uh, as you go in and look, this being the 50th anniversary year of Aloha, I've done a lot of research going back and looking, because you, you, you lose the timeline from when you're, uh -huh. you know, a kid at the time. And the rush to get it out, like you said, to beat the bootleggers, the world saw this live, but the United States, we had to wait till April, because it was a little football game called the Super Bowl on that night. <laughs> But uh, also, it kind of gave distance. I think uh, in Elvis's career, it gave distance because Elvis on tour was still in the theaters and successful, and very successful. And they didn't want to yeah. jump on that, let that movie do. And then the uh, the TV special in April, we already had the album. We were already familiar with the music, um, and that got in so quickly for the rest of the world. And also, very wisely, uh, as Elvis did uh, in concert. <laughs> The uh, song selection for Aloha is something that was talked about. Oh yeah, but that was a, that was complicated because yeah. they, remember they did Elvis on tour back in mainly April, March and April, and uh, and the repertoire he was doing there uh, was the same repertoire roughly that he took into Madison Square Garden three months later, and that came out on a record. So now that they wanted to do a new live album, yeah, just like seven months later, you, you couldn't have the same songs in there. But of course, you had to close with um, Can't Help Falling in Love and Trilogy, because they, these were high points uh, or significant points. But you could change uh, That's All Right as the opening card with C.C. Ryder, mm -hmm. and you could you know, change other songs along there. But you also had to bring in new repertoire, enough new repertoire to justify people who just bought Madison Square Garden would also buy this. Already in August of 72, he'd, uh, 
it brought fever and and uh, and what now my love into to, to the show. And on a few occasions, he even tried out uh, James Taylor's Steamroller Blues. Mm -hmm. But as they go along, they will have to figure out what other songs. There's a beautiful version of I Remember You that connects to the whole Hawaii background of it because it was written by a guy from from Hawaii. And, and there were also other considerations of songs I was felt in love with. I mean, You Gave Me a Mountain is as dramatic as is what now, my love. It's that whole emotional thing. And of course, even if I was, may have had his misgivings, he had to perform his new number one single, Burning Love. And, and that sounds kind of cooking, uh, as you will hear now in our wonderful new mix. <laughs> Oh, that's, 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 I want to come back here and hear well, the Was that enough saxophone for you? That was enough saxophone. Oh, okay. <laughs> thank you. Well, saxophone. I do play saxophone. And I'm hearing horns I've never heard before. Right. Maestro Gershio's orchestra I've never heard like that before. James on the guitar. I mean, everybody just cooking on that. It's the Glad second, me. that's your second song of your yeah, yeah. world concert and it's just cooking. It's just amazing. Thank well, you. We, we'll come up with an explanation on my right here. Well, you know, I was just looking behind you at what's on the screen, and those are those tape boxes from back in the day that they worked with, that they mixed in a day, and, you know, maybe if somebody had the technology available at the time, and maybe a little more time, they could have uh, done something with that. And, and Ernst, I know you have a friend that you sat at a board with, and you guys worked on this project yeah, yeah, together. Would you like to bring your well, your, well, your, your, your cohort, you, 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 I guess? You should. I, I think we should, okay. yeah. Because Matt, he's hearing applause. <laughs> Matt Rush Bang. Hey. Ooh, there's a chemistry and electricity between yeah, you. Yeah, it is. <laughs> did you feel that you felt the electricity did between you? Did you? Or it was just a feedback. Maybe it was just feedback. You think we didn't know? Uh, exactly. These <laughs> audio guys, you know. Oh, yeah, we're, we're, we're a bit of, we're loonies, right? A little bit. Oh, yeah, black. absolutely. Let's see. We'll, we'll try and, and uh, explain why you can take something that was such an enormous success and everybody loved it and it sounded great and actually make it greater. And, and we, we, we don't want to be too boastful. I'll be boastful on his behalf and he'll be shy as he always is. But there is an explanation. One is the talent of the man who actually does the job. There are other elements to it because money pays into this as well. Back then, uh, an album was mixed from 8 to 4 on a Tuesday, and that was it, one day. I don't think I'm exaggerating when, when, when I say that Matt spends certainly a month on an album, which of course, the, more, the harder you try, the better it gets. But it's also about a mindset, and the first time I tried to figure out what, what it was that was so good about the mixes he'd made for me, uh, he, he, he said, well, I always try to make my hero Elvis's voice sound as good as it possibly can. So how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, luckily, it, it was all these things have been recorded so well, so all the magic's already there. The band played it great, so you don't have to fabricate anything. So then it's just really accentuating it. So. Uh, this is a live concert, so Elvis's voice is also the drums, it's also the horns, it's also the everything. Oh, it leaks into the yeah, microphone. all okay. the sounds leak into it. So if you mute, a lot of times when we make records, we mute the voice and work on the band. But if you do that with a live concert, you're not hearing the band how they're going to hear until you have Elvis's mic up. And that's where all the energy is. So I always start with Elvis's mic and do what I need to do there. And then now, where they would mix by hand, and you, to, to remix a song or to fix it, they have to recreate their hand movement. So every mix would be completely different. I can save my little moves on the faders in the computer, uh, and then I can recreate my mix or turn stuff up or down. So really, I, could, I can take more time with it, as you said. Well, let's, let's try and hear what it is you start working with. So let, let's hear a track, The Beautiful I'm So Lonesome I Could Cry. And it's only the vocal. Thank you. Thank you.
you. Wow. Had this been a studio recording, you would have had Elvis' voice isolated. Only yeah. Elvis' voice. But, but this is a live concert, so whatever is picked up at Elvis' vocal microphone from the background is, is what you hear. And it presents a little bit of a problem when you start mixing. Yeah, if I turn up Elvis' voice, I turn up all of that. Uh, so it depends where, and he would move on stage, you know, so if he's by Ronnie Tut, his voice is going to be a lot of Ronnie Tut. And you can hear a lot of kissing going on on Can't Help Fall. <laughs> 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 Uh, and he always wore the rings. The rings were funny because the rings always clack on the microphone. So I can get a kissing track from yeah, you? I can do give you a kissing track. Oh, well, that's, that's, that's maybe an uh, That's the next one. That's a new single. But, <laughs> but, but, but the, really, the, the big balance for uh, a project like this compared to other projects we've done, with a live concert, you want to feel the energy and the excitement like, of you being in the crowd. So the louder you turn Elvis's voice, you kind of are pushing the band farther back. So you have to get the right balance of having Elvis up front, but then you feel when Ronnie Tut goes somewhere, you feel when the horns come in. So really that's the balance I try to get, is keeping it very exciting while you guys get to hear every bit of Elvis's voice. So when you analyze, what do I need to do through the voice? I mean, what, what should I do, reverb, uh, your compression, this, that, and the other, if you do any of that? Where do you go next, to bass and drums? Uh, it just depends on the song, really. And a lot of times with live concerts, people will get one setting and then do it to all of it. But I treat each song like it's its own right. entity. So I don't, I don't uh, just kind of phone that part in. But you know, in Times of Lonesome I Can Cry, that's very tender. So the drums don't need to be too present or too big. They're kind of, you want to feel them more than you hear them. But like Burning Love, when Ronnie Tut goes all over the kit, you want to turn that up and feel it impact you. So really, it's kind of a song by song and in a moment by moment in each song. Well, we, we want to get to our next track here because uh, when I first heard it, it blew me away, but uh, I say that because otherwise he gets irritating. <laughs> uh, but, but one song stood out and I, I just couldn't believe what you'd done to it and, and, uh, and what we should be listening for is not only Elvis's voice, but in this arrangement you can hear detail that you never heard before, where Matt has spent endless time on adjusting this piece or that piece, the piano thing here, you know, all over the, uh, the place. Everything has been uh, looked at, and uh, there's thought behind any, everything he does here. It's, it's all there for a purpose. So, so please tell me what your favorite is, because it's also mine. Uh, I, I chose uh, something. Uh, uh, by the Beatles, obviously, that Elvis cut. But this one, if you have heard this original box set or the original recording a lot and seen the concert, this one, you, you will hear the strings. You will hear Glenn Hardin. You'll hear James Burton like you've never heard before. And so it was really fun for me to, I always A, B the original mix when I'm working to make sure I'm not doing harm. Uh, <laughs> the overall fear. And okay. so uh, it was really fun to listen to the original like I remember and then popping, popping this new one. In, so. well, okay, let's, let's hear it. Oh, cool. oh, oh, somebody bumped the record player back there. <laughs> but thanks for sharing this with us. It's a miracle. I'll see you in the lot. Matt Ross, Incredible. I'll come over and do the fade outs for you because that was a little abrupt. Yeah, yeah but I don't, know, I, I don't know what happened. An but issue yeah. there. Uh, what, what gets me is that there are things on this because we've heard it a thousand times, but it, but it, like Matt was saying, it's, it was always there. Yeah. It was just in a place that couldn't be accessed by our ears. And for and, you guys and, to go and sing uh, 20 songs in eight hours, I mean, I mean, the amount of time you spend on that is. is uh, yeah. Uh, incredible. But did you guys hear stuff you've never heard? Yeah. I mean, yeah. we're talking like we're experts, yeah. but can you? Can you? Yeah. 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 On the next time you hear it, just listen to where the horns come in and it all becomes big. And then you can still hear all these little things left, right. And it's like, oh, yeah. there's a piano there. Oh, listen to the strings there. Mm -hmm. So that's the magic of working with new technology we have, we have much better technology and real talent like uh like uh mad there's always a reason for songs to appear uh 
um, and we'll get to that in a minute, but, but there's also reasons why salt didn't appear. Because all the way through, uh, that's the way it is, when they filmed all the rehearsals, I'm sure you've seen them at various places, MGM and, and, and Las Vegas, Elvis is practicing something again and again, just like he's singing yesterday, hey Jude. When it comes to the time of the filming, they only spent one camera on something that Elvis did perform in one of the shows, and it didn't come out on the record. And you kind of think, well, Elvis maybe have not been so enthusiastic about what he'd done. But it turns out that the reality was that when you make the big business behind it, that's the way it is. Movies. There's all kinds of rules and regulations and the colonel still controlled the Elvis publishing. So if you didn't assign part of your writer's share to the colonel, he wouldn't let Elvis record the song. And by 1969, to go to Mr. Uh, Lennon, McCartney, and Harris and say, oh, Elvis want to record um, your song, but he wasn't to have some of your songwriter money. Yeah. That was a no-go. And it didn't happen. And when we got to Aloha from Hawaii, the colonel's publishing, uh, arrangement had fallen apart, and and it was probably at a time where Elvis didn't care whether the yeah. rules were applied. But that's why that song was not in "That's the Way It Is," but came in here. And there was there's different stories about all these songs that some of us and others go real deep into figuring out. <laughs> but but sometimes we get the explanation. Sometimes we have Elvis up on stage ready to go into the next song, you ain't nothing. No, that's not that song. He goes into, a, stops for a minute and says, this song means a lot to me, or this song is so beautiful, where he takes one of the 20 songs out and makes a special intro. And, and the one we're gonna hear now is called, It's Over. And I, I know- and, um, and, and before we do that though, because I, I, I do wanna tag yeah, on here. Yeah. Uh, Elvis's song selection, like you said, by this time is he wants to sing what he wants to sing. Sure. And even in the 70s on albums and everywhere, you kind of knew where Elvis's head was by the songs he was selecting to sing. That's a good and, point. And yeah. this is another example of that. Of what's, look at the timeline. What's going on in Elvis's life when he sings a song like this, when he sings a song like Fool? when he sings a song like Separate Ways or Always On My Mind, those songs about love and love gone. And it's, it's interesting, the selection. No, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very and, good and this point. Song, this song, I think, is a, is a great example of that. And maybe why he called it out special. You know? Yeah, I, I think it is. And it's, it's beautiful. Uh, he sings it with great sincerity, but it's not something that he keeps singing. Yeah, it's of the time, of, the, of that moment where he was. Yes. Yeah. So, it's over, but it's not. We're coming back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not subtle with some of his endings, you know. They built and built and built, and then he just topped it. That's amazing. And I, we, we were just talking about at the time back when this came out. Uh, Roger asked me. He said, "Did you? Did you? By this time, did you have a big stereo? Or did you have?" I said, "Oh, I had a stereo that played LPs and A tracks, and had and had two speakers." But wow. uh, I, I just have one speaker. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you've made up for it by now. I've got big speakers. I, I tell you, I. I yeah. <laughs> this is like everybody wants a room like this at their house to listen to, uh, to Elvis. It's been great to, to, to really go through this packaging, and I know that this is one of your specialties can I, of, can I of like how you how you put all this together. Because I've got a story to tell about this. Um, is there anyone else in the UK from here? Uh, yeah. oh, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I have to say that we were. We were shortchanged in the United Kingdom because we didn't get a lower from Hawaii until 1978. But we did get this. <laughs> but yeah, we, we didn't get to see the show because uh, we were impoverished and the BBC wouldn't pay the money. 
which is incredible when you when you think about it now. Wow. Yeah. Uh, but we enjoyed it in uh, 78. So yeah. there you go. The other key thing about this album, the, the historic thing for me, is this is the last Elvis album that I ever had to buy because I joined RCA three months later. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. So that's good. But um, <laughs> I've been getting my money back ever since. <laughs> On all, the old, on all the old records. Yeah, I was going to say, you're almost even now. I'm near, nearly, nearly even. Nearly Give me a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, the, the great thing about this album is, I said earlier, it really stood out in the marketplace. And quite frankly, when you think what it was competing with, it's quite staggering because uh, the UK charts, the American charts, were full of Led Zeppelin, uh, Elton John, Genesis, David Bowie. I mean, it, it was incredible what this was competing with. So uh, it really did stand out. Um, but it competed in that marketplace. But I think it's fair to say that uh, it actually means something more now than it did then to me because the artwork was great, but I was always, I think one of the reasons why I started doing Elvis artwork as soon as I possibly could, which was that year, um, it, it was, I really wanted to get it right because we'd been, uh, had an Elvis albums time after time, probably with, with Elvis with a jumpsuit and uh, nothing else, quite frankly, to enjoy in the package itself. So the greatest um, enjoyment for me is being able to take these original albums and we've replicated this in exactly the same way that it was, because that's the right thing to do. But then we get to create a fabulous box set, which, uh, this time round, that we've kept the same original sleeve, but when you go inside the package, we're now able to obviously source, locate, find wonderful photographs that were actually from the show itself. Um, and that's a, a great thing to be able to do. Uh, as we showed earlier, we get access to the original recording tape boxes that we can feature in the packages. Uh, we then can go and find a, Eight track cartridge tapes. Yes. yes. RCA records and tapes. <laughs> RCA records and tapes. Um, and uh, just generally find all the memorabilia that, that goes with that event that was never there in the first place. Oh, and yeah, there's a joy, a joy in that process in the same way that Ernst and Matt recreate the music and put that right. There's, it, my, there's my eight track. There's your eight track. Yeah. Uh, I'll send it back to you next week. <laughs> <laughs> There's a real joy in, in this process, and uh, this is the glory of what we're able to do, is to get it, get it right for the time and uh, create these packages. So in addition to all these wonderful photographs and memorabilia that exist in the box set, um, we've also got, obviously, two CDs of uh, the, the original concerts that are newly mixed by Matt. Uh, we've got a bonus CD of the after-show recordings uh, that Elvis did, which uh, I think includes all of the outtakes that are available, yeah, everything. The five songs. Yeah, five songs, and they're, they're glorious to listen to. You've got to bear in mind, Elvis is singing these songs at about four o'clock in the morning after everyone's left the concert hall. Yeah. Uh, and it's remarkable that there is still humor. Mm -hmm. uh, after all of that, is, there's still some humor going on. And it really does illustrate the terrific banter between Marty Pacetta who I mentioned earlier, yeah. that he's constantly talking to Marty uh, as they're doing the track. In broadcasting, the, the, the producer director's up in the booth, and that's called Voice of God, when they talk down to the, you know, <laughs> Elvis, you need to uh, try, that, try that one one more time, Elvis. I, I know it's 4 a.m., um, you know, sunny and red, the car's running, just get out there and uh, just do it one more time for us. And, he's, and he laughs about it. And, yeah, but you, that's the voice of God of Marty Pacetta. On and, and, and you probably know that there's obviously some sync delay process where they're waiting, is it, for the cameras or the tape to, mm -hmm. to get in sync so you can start singing. Yeah. But anyway, there's all this terrific banter, which I personally, I think all of us really enjoy listening to now, is Elvis having fun and talking. And it's just a joy to listen to. And it's a great CD in this package. And then obviously on top of that, we've got for the first time the entire show on Blu-ray, the rehearsal and the main concert, yeah. and a couple of those outtakes where they just used a very basic camera on Elvis as he was singing the songs. And, and he didn't have his belt on because he had threw, threw it away. Threw it, threw it in the audience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so all of that stuff is featured in this uh, new box set uh, that's out now. And uh, as I say, the, the vinyl version is also available. So it's, it's been a labor of love I think for all of us to be able to do this, and we 
sincerely hope that you really enjoy it because it deserves to be enjoyed for sure. Thank you. And what I love about this, thank you. Oh, clap for Roger, please. That gatefold, was this Elvis's first gatefold? You had a couple oh, of boxes. A no, you had back in Oh, that's right. <laughs> uh, Elvis is back. Yeah, 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 yeah. Elvis is back. So, but what I love, oh, what I love, it is, is you've yeah. recreated. <laughs> you, you actually did a little work on that. Well, we, I, I think some people still think that Elvis is actually standing with all those beautiful Hawaiian ladies. Uh, but I don't want to shatter the illusion for anyone, but he's not. And uh, he, he was just literally... Uh, over uh, laid onto the actual photo. But I believe we call it cut and paste in the 70s. <laughs> Literally <laughs> cut and paste. Well, I used to be a cut and paste artist. Yeah, well, you could have done better Does than that. Does that sound good or not? I yeah. don't know, but that's, just, that's what I started off doing. But uh, I mean, it's, the detail is it's probably quite boring, but actually restoring and making that photograph look a lot better than it did on the original album was worthwhile because they cut Elvis's hair out like really bad. Uh, look at the original, look at that, and you'll see that Elvis's hairline is, is correct now, but, and as, as it should be. As it should be, as it should be. Well, thank you for your work thank you. on that. And finally, you know, like you were saying, uh, something we didn't have at the time, because one of the cool things when I was a kid was you, get, you got the album, and some of the artists, you would put the album on and you would read along with yeah. the lyrics. You would look and see who the band was in the band and where it was recorded. Elvis almost never had that information. And what you get now when you get the CD is you get the book. You know, you've got the yeah. book and now you can read the book along, the notes, and listen to the CDs of the music. It's just, oh, it's just so much fun. It's so much fun now. And this product, I mean, this, this iconic concert having its 50th birthday this year finally gets a mix that's, I mean, more than a day. Is, is, at least that alone is, yeah. is, is a, a happy birthday present for Aloha from Hawaii. <coughs> and that's one of the things about this whole thing, what you were saying, is with as much pressure as he had on him to, to, to have this album be successful, how did this album do on the charts for Elvis? Well, it was certainly number one in America and in many, many countries throughout the world. Um, uh, it, it, it sold uh, more than almost 300,000 uh, in the first shipment, you know, when you put out the record in February in, in America. Uh, you see, how big was it? I mean, it was number one in Denmark, it was number one in something. What, what was it in England? How well, I think it got to around 10, but bear in mind we yeah, didn't have the special. They, they, they've always been behind. <laughs> Um, well, they didn't have a that's special not, that's for five years. We didn't have the special, man. Yeah. And you're not blaming that on me. <laughs> I feel like I'm in the UN right now. <laughs> well, with it's the a family rivalry. Yeah. But, but there is a crazy story in here because uh, Roger and I have, of course, known that this would be coming for several years, and we were preparing for it. And uh, uh, there was one thing that I uh, really wanted to do and failed. Because in 1973, Elvis gets his last RCA royalty statement for all of the recordings he made before that day. On the February 28th, that's when the statement came out. On March 1st, the Colonel and Elvis had sold the rights to their older recordings to RCA for a five million plus amount. Uh, that seems like a stupid figure today. I think it was a stupid figure back then, but they needed the money. But the consequence for this in what I tried to do was trying to establish how big was this album was, we knew what they sent into the shops the first week. Then RCA didn't have to send royalty statements because they didn't send it. Uh, they didn't send Elvis any royalties. Yeah. And the record didn't enter the number one spot until May of 73. RCA didn't get computerized sales figures until January of 75. So we don't know at all what that album sold after the first release date through the whole period where it was number one, number 10 in the charge for a year. We have no clue, there is no evidence ever. 
The only thing we know is that it's 35 five-time platinum uh, by today, but we can all try and imagine what the real number is. Wow. You know? wow. Can I just uh, yeah. ask one trivia question? For, for, does anybody know what album uh, this knocked off the number one spot in America? Led Zeppelin? Huh? Led Zeppelin? No. I don't know. I don't know. No, it was, uh, it was Dark Side of the Moon, Pink Floyd. Oh, 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 good wow. <laughs> I, I have a trivia question for you. Do you, know, do you know what song uh, kept Burning Love from number one on the pop? <laughs> Chuck Berry's My ding -ling. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't hear him remixing that one. That's why God invented Cashbox magazine. <laughs> we, we didn't have that. We had number one on Cashbox. That's right. Well, what we've been talking about, and you and you alluded to it in the uh, the outtakes from four o'clock in the morning after he's done an incredible worldwide performance, is Elvis cutting those songs uh, afterwards for the little video montages, and he still has his sense of humor and as we were talking about with the songs that he selected for this, how important the song selection for this was to differentiate it from Madison Square Garden, which had been the previous mm -hmm. album, yeah, yeah. and selecting songs of what was touching him in his life. He still found those songs from his career back in the day, 50s and 60s. He still found a few songs that he could have fun with on stage. Yeah, I don't think a big hunger, hunger, love had a lot to do with his emotional state. Not at all. No, not at all. Uh, but it was fun to play and sing. And, and again, you know, he took out, uh, let's say he took out uh, uh, Hound Dog. He didn't, but that, he swapped those older songs as well. Yeah. I'm just surprised that he took this one because it's awfully wordy, as Elvis would often say. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of words in here, and you have to do them real. Yeah. But it's rocking like... Uh, God knows what, but, but the band is cooking and they are having fun. And when you talk to musicians, whether they were on stage with him or they were at rehearsals, it was always fun to play music with Elvis. So let, let's hear a big hung up and have fun. sometimes be Charlie Hodge for an Elvis tribute artist. Oh, sometimes I do? Yeah, I'm, I actually uh, okay. came in third. Yeah, sure. uh, in Charlie Hodge. <laughs> I came in second. I came in second in the Vernon Presley. You did? Yeah. Yeah. Huh? Uh, but, but sometimes I'm, I do Charlie Hodge, and I'll tell you what it is about them having fun on this song, because they know it's over. They know they've done it, because all they've got to do now after this song is can't help falling in love and say goodbye. So this is their last chance with a song that's a rocker to just say, did it. Yeah. We did it. We did this satellite. And that's it. And they go right into Can't Help Falling in Love. Yeah, but see, that wouldn't explain Long Tall Sally a whole lot of shit going on, would it? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, that's there as well, and that's cooking as. I mean, oh, yeah. Well, but, but, but this is the one before the last song. Oh, they, yeah, they're yeah, done. Yeah, yeah. So, so you're telling me he's holding back on the other one? <laughs> <laughs> Elvis holding back. What did I tell you about? Being difficult with both of them. What did I tell him about? Yes, <laughs> but you're, you're, there is, but there is an element of that, but, but there's a, certainly an element of that, but it, it's again the pacing of the show. Some of us basically in the, the late 60s and the early 70s would want all the songs to be rock and roll, or you know, yeah. the more the better. But you I'm, had to have songs where you could relax, right? And where you I, could I understand play. that, but I'm talking to you as a performer, which you wouldn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> when you're on stage, you are a performer. I, I don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> when you're on stage doing a show with a lot, you'll cut this part out. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to say good night, and they're going to be gone already. <laughs> It'll be like the end of Aloha. I'll, just do, good. I'll do the goodbyes Sounds by myself. Good. Uh, when you, I'm, what am I talking about? You, you know what I'm talking about. Rock and and how great do you feel when you know you've done something and all you got to do is like one more step and you're done. That's, that's, that's all I'm saying. But it's fantastic. Don't, I'm not belittling your work. It's an incredible. Yes, you are. Good. No. <laughs> <laughs> not as far as you know. Um, 
it's it's been it's been amazing to be able to listen to this, and I want to thank everybody, uh, Tom, and everybody from Sony, who, when we were preparing this, unlike in years past, um, I said, well, you know, about how long do we want the songs to go? And he said, you know what, Tom, they deserve it. Play it all the way through. Right. So let's hear it for them, because we could have gotten you out of here earlier, but I don't think we minded listening to the entire song selection. And what about the work of Ernst and Matt Ross? Yay! Yeah. Fantastic. Any, any, any parting shots, Roger? That you'd like to uh, not a you, personally. No, thank you. I've got nothing but admiration for what you do. Thank you. you hold it all together, thank God. <laughs> I just uh, want to say what a privilege, privilege it is to be here and with this album. Um, it's always an honour and we are so privileged to be able to work with Elvis. So we're as much fans as you guys are sitting in the audience, so it's a thrill for us to be here. Uh, it's remarkable that we're still here after all these years, yeah. quite frankly, but uh, thanks for all your support and for buying our records and being here now. It shows that we all really still care and love Elvis, so thank you very much. Yeah. And yet, I think he makes a great point. The, the way you guys work is extra, the extra TLC, the extra love that you take because you are fans of, of this. Yeah, of it, it, it's been a funny thing. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, Elvis uh, was the king of pop in Europe. I mean, forget how Dog and Yellowhouse Rock. We grew up on I Lonesome Tonight, Little Sister, Surrender, She's Not You. And, and suddenly in, in the middle of the 60s, that whole world collapsed because if I tried to defend Aram Scaram in my school class, that <laughs> <laughs> was high. So I bought Doors records and Rolling Stones records because I wanted to be hip like the rest of them. And I secretly bought those Elvis albums. And that's where my whole passion came from, that I couldn't believe that Elvis Presley could put out within months singing Old MacDonald <laughs> and three months later or three months earlier whatever he'd released Big Boss Man these were two complete different people yeah yeah and that's where my passion for finding out why why is it like this <laughs> and, and, and 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 get into this whole idea of researching who played on this that and the other but that passion I was able to maintain although I played a lot of different music at home as well. Yeah, it's yeah. still there at the heart, and it will never go away. I think it's great that, that this music is, is still preserved like this, and technology has finally caught up to be able to handle Elvis and his band and his orchestra in the best way possible. We want to thank you guys for being here, and uh, we're going to leave you with, uh, with one more song as we say goodbye. And uh, on, this, on this particular song, um, listen to some things also that you've never heard before. This is an American trilogy with what I consider to be the greatest flute solo in the history of rock and roll. Yeah. Um, enjoy this song. Um, Elvis Aloha from Hawaii via satellite is available wherever you download or get your music on RCA Records and Tapes. And so, yes. That's right. That's right. Thank you guys very much. Thank you for loving Elvis, and we will see you soon. Thank you. Yay.